Here we go. Awesome. So we are live. Excellent. All right, here we are, everybody. Thank you, as always, for joining us on Third Eye Salon. If this is your first time or if you have been one of our regulars, I am Kat Udera. I am an empath, I am an entrepreneur, and I am a psychic wrangler. So welcome to Third Eye Salon, where we each, where in each and every week, um, we look between the veils of reality. And today we are taking a fresh look between the veils of an NDE experience, which led to a Kundalini awakening and then exploration through DMT. So we're gonna look and see how all those things are connected and how they all interplay with our guests today. But first let's see who's in the salon. So, hey, Linda Coulter Burge, how are you doing today? I love you, you're looking great with that background. Thank you, Kat. I am having a wonderful morning. I found this amazing backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I am so excited to be with my peeps again. We love you so much. And I know I'm old calling you peeps, but I don't care. So, <laughs> um, I really am excited to talk with Bill. And as always, as we do this, please make sure that when you make your comments that you are kind. And if I get someone who is not so kind, who has all the answers, and who isn't willing to listen to <laughs> others, then, you know, I will give you a warning, and then you're out. So my rule has always been be nice or get out. And I hold strong to that. So I am, so the people that don't know me, I am a psychic, a conscious coach, and a business coach. And so I love this show. It is my highlight of every day when I come in and I watch the old episodes. So <laughs> anyway, I will turn this over. Oh, before I do that, I want to make sure you guys like, share, and subscribe. Hit that bell so that you're notified when we have our show because sometimes we do start a little late. But, and sometimes we have special shows that aren't on our normal time. So mm -hmm. make sure you do that. And with that, I am going to turn it over to beautiful Jillian Leonard. Hi, everyone. I'm Jillian. I'm a Kundalini, ET, OBE, and spirit experiencer. Um, we invite you to be sure to check out the links in the description box below. Uh, thank you to everyone who donates to Third Eye Salon. And we would love to have you in the Facebook group and as well as liking the events page. Um, like to say welcome to our guest, Bill Lefson. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, ladies. Yeah, it's great to have Bill here. I saw Bill on, a, on another uh, podcast show and I fell in love and I had to have him on the show. So I'm so glad it worked out. I'm going to read into Bill's bio here and then we are going to get into Bill's NDE experience and then we're just going to build from there. It's so good. All right. William J. Letson is a retired fire captain and forester of 35 years. In 1994, his engine company re uh, responded to and uh, treated a severely ill patient in the Santa Barbara area. Within a few days, he was hospitalized with a similar illness and was admitted to intensive care where he spent the night extremely dehydrated with failing vital signs. During that night, he underwent a profound near-death experience where he separated from his physical body, traveled through a star-filled realm, and interacted with some very strange otherworldly beings. Bill spent the next 15 years quietly trying to make sense of this incredibly blissful sensations of dying, the very unusual and loving beings he met with, and the persistence of self-consciousness without a material body. Meaning, what's it mean to be alive without a body and how do you reconcile that once you come back into your body? After recognizing the similarities in many other accounts of ND years in, in 2010, Bill set out to discover firsthand the true nature of our earthly journey. He tells the tale of a powerful but wise and kind shamans, aliens, alien abductions, ghosts, magical chi, mysterious jungle villages, unlimited cosmic energies, kundalini, and, the, and a very unlikely awakening. 
Built around the little known teachings and discoveries of Nikola, Nikola Tesla, Edgar Cayce and Wilhelm Reich, Dr. Jill Bolt Taylor, Osho, Robert Monroe, Dr. Mary Neal, and many more, Bill's straight talk story will introduce any would-be seeker to a mystical world that has been mostly hidden and nearly erased from our cultural mainstream. Bill lives in Atascadero, California with Leah, his wife of 40 years, along with their ranch cats, running dogs, joyful egg laying hens. He likes to split his time between California and Costa Rica and he can be reached at B-L-E-T-S-O-N 56 B Letson. 56 at gmail.com and that's also down in our box below. So if you are excited to hear about Bill's journey uh, to the other side and back, give us a thumbs up. And you know, one of the things when I, we, I talked with you earlier, Bill, was uh, we never talked about alien abductions and mysterious jungle villages and all this, like I, you just got a book in you. And, and mm, I, if, if any of that comes up, Jillian, make sure he talks about the alien abductions. I know <laughs> that's gonna be your area, but, but Bill, go ahead and, and crack the egg open and let us know about your experience first of your NDE and, and get us into those details so we can start exploring this with you. Okay. And um, you guys feel free to interrupt and uh, ask questions along the way because. Oh, we do. <laughs> okay. So uh, it was uh, 1994. I was a uh, fireman in my thirties and I was working in Santa Barbara and we went to a call. Uh, there was a, a, a big, flu epidemic going on in Santa Barbara, Goleta area. And we went to this, uh, this call, the woman was really sick. A couple of us got exposed and we got it within a couple of days. We were really ill with the flu. And I got really dehydrated. You know how you where you're throwing up and it's go, going both ways. And mm -hmm. I got dehydrated in uh, quickly um, to where it kind of startled me. I, I rolled out of bed on my way to the, to the bathroom and um, I was really gaunt and uh, I tried to get my radial pulse and I couldn't get a radial pulse. And so that's, you know, your pressure's below 80 when you, when you're in that. And, um, and I, I was really, so anyway, I got, you know, I called the, I called my sister and she called the ambulance and a bunch of fire guys, my buddies came, picked me up and, took me in on an, in an ambulance. I got a couple of IVs. Um, I got to the ER and um, still really dehydrated, but starting to come around with the IVs and starting to float the system again. And I was given um, this uh, synthetic morphine and this other thing for um, nausea. And the whole emergency room was full of people and they all had the same thing. And they were just giving it to everybody, boom, boom, boom. And, and I was like, you know, I'm feeling a little bit better. I, I don't think I need anything. Um, you know, I might even get dressed here in a little bit and head home. And uh, my family was there and um, nope, doctor's orders. And they pushed this through and this, um, you know, my pressure was still down there. It was down in the 80s, 90s. And um, that, that, that morphine, it was, Nubane was the name of the drug. It just, phasodilates, all your vessels just, you know, get really huge. And so your volume drops and your pressure just drops out. And that's kind of, I've never really talked about the details of that in the past because I didn't know if the ND years wanted to, to hear all that, but, um, and that, that's what started it. I just, my eyes, my wife said, my eyes rolled back and you just fell flat back on the gurney and you were gone. And they came in and they, they Narcan you a few times um, and she started writing everything down. And then they started, they started two IVs and the Narcan is to, to kill the, um, the morphine. It works really fast on that. They, you know, we would, if we would run on a um, drug addict, first thing you do is give them Narcan hmm. to kill, kill the opiates or, wow. you know, so uh, yeah, they Narcan me a few times and, um, got the IVs going, hope for the best. I still wasn't coming back. This was about, about three or four in the afternoon. And then um, it took me up to um, intensive care and just kept, I guess they, in the morning I was told they gave me 11 bags, 11 um, liters. 
and that's that's crazy um, of fluids. So during the night, and you know, I've never really talked about the whole thing with the the doctor, the, the fire department. We had a, a physician who was our our guy. He took care of us all. He checked us out and everything. And he followed up on this, and that um, I didn't make uh, a stink because accidents happen, but the, that people that were in the emergency room, they disappeared. He came to me and said, we fixed that problem. And, and uh, anyway, that was a, it was a big mistake. And, you know, those things quietly go away in the, in the AMA world. Um, so the mistake was that they were like, that, that the emergency people went away and left you on your own. Is that what you're saying? I'll make sure I'm tracking that. Yeah, the um, when I got the the new vein, when it was injected, it was injected straight in. Um, and normally, you count these things down. If you ever watch nurses, they push things and they check their ner- their watch, and they push a little bit more, and they take about two minutes. But it all went in, and I went and I went down. Um, my wife said it was really comical. It was really obvious what had happened. Mm. So anyway, all, all that aside, so. Um, so yeah, there I was up in uh, intensive care, and the, the next thing I know is I am f- flying through a realm of stars. It's it, it was amazing. I felt absolutely euphoric, and um, um, there were these stars all around me, and all I can all I could do for 20 years is call them stars. Um, Mm. But they were these balls, these colored balls, and they were just loving me. They were just welcoming and loving. And I felt like I'd been let out of a hot, dark closet. And I felt like someone was pouring honey all over my brain and it just wouldn't stop. It was just a standard peak euphoria existence. And um, that's where we come from. I mean, I I don't know if that helps anybody, but that is where we come from. And, uh, you know, we're just down here muddling in this, uh, in in this issues that we have, and um, we don't have any problems. So anyway, that's where I was, and I was flying along, and I was like, how in the, how in the world did I forget who I really was? It was so perplexing that I thought I was this guy who, I mean, I like Bill, you know, he's, he's fun, but I was like this guy and he, you know, he was a Goomba and I didn't want anything to do with him. And I was done with him. I was done with that. And, uh, you know, family and everything I had going the career, it didn't mean anything. It was like, it was a big joke. It was like, it was a, it was a big trick. That's what, like it was a big trick, an illusion. And so anyway, I was flying through these stars and I was thinking, how in the world did I forget who I really was? I had all these thoughts, all these, I mean, you, you knew everything, formulas and theories, and you could see calculations and they were just flying by you. And, um, and then I landed. I landed somewhere and it was a real place. It had indirect lighting, it was solid. And there were tables there and equipment and there were um, these beings there and they were in front of me and they were these three short little hooded guys. And if you ever watch that movie Communion, they looked exactly like those guys with the the frumpy faces um, that, Christopher Walken, he he meets them and they're they're high fiving him and they're goofing around and stuff. This is exactly, you know, whoever whoever wrote that. That's a message. That's it's exactly what I saw. And um, except they had these huge smiles. They went from from ear to ear and these big toothy smiles. And the guys in that movie, they look a little grumpy, but this <laughs> wasn't this wasn't what I saw. What I saw was just love. And they were so happy to see me and they were kidding around. They were giggling towards each other, you know, talking to each other and giggling. 
And, uh, you know, I kept hearing things like, what did you learn? What can you tell us? And, um, uh, you know, I must have looked uh, pretty shocked. And uh, one of them turned to the other and he said, he doesn't remember us. And um, they were, they all started giggling. <laughs> and then there was this other guy who was kind of in charge, but not like a supervisor. It, it was like these, these guys, these knuckleheads could do whatever they wanted. <laughs> These disorderlies could do whatever they wanted. And uh, he was just there to, I don't know, oversee things. But um, he was like this tall, wispy thing, like a kind of a trimmed down Gumby, like a, like a cactus or something, like a stick, like a stick, walking stick. Okay. And he had this huge smile on his face and it never left him. And um, he came close. And when he came close to me, my throat like clamped down and my chest expanded and I thought I was going to burst into tears um it was so overwhelming and I, I thought oh, my chest was going to explode and it was what this was was love um I was ill prepared for the intensity of love on the, that where we come from and um and so he was really cool and he you know, it was like he was underwater. There was like, it was like this wispy thing and parts of him were uh, coming off like vapor or something. As he moved, he was in sections. And um, it was really hard to uh, explain um, that sense of it. Um, so there, it wasn't much going on there. You know, at one point I said, can we, um, you know, you guys want to get started? Because I'm not going back there. There's no way. So can we get started on this? Uh, you know, let's do review my life. You know, what's next? Let's, let's, um, and the tall guy just started laughing and he just chuckled. It was the sweetest laugh. And he said, oh, sure, sure. We can do that. How do you want to start? And, uh, you know, I started, I told a few stories and um, they didn't, they weren't really listening. <laughs> You know, they, they didn't care. They, I think they knew the program. The program was for me to see something and uh, a seed to be planted. And then, you know, when I was sent back, it was up to me. Was I going to talk about it or was I going to, you know, uh, get a bottle of old granddad and uh, think about it the rest of my life? You know, which is what a lot of people do because it's so disturbing. And um mm -hmm. So yeah, they knew I wasn't uh, I wasn't staying, and it was kind of a it's kind of a show. And um, I talked for a while, and then he said, "All right, you got to go back." And uh, that really shocked me. And I tried to talk him out of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I told him, you know, that I got a lot of friends and stuff, but they're going to be fine. They don't care. The only people that's going to really hurt is my parents and my wife. And um, and I told them, you know, they're strong people. They'll get over it. And, uh, I'll, I, you know, I can stay. It's I'm not, there's nothing there that I need to go back to. You know, I'm pushing 40 at the time, and, you know, like an old dude. And uh, he chuckled some more. And I, as, he, as he came forward, I was being, you know, energetically, whatever, pushed back. And then I, there was this, uh, then I, I started back. And I knew it was over because, he just kind of dematerialized. Yeah. Um, if you like, a, you know, um, what's her name? Um, Grimes, Roberta Grimes. She talks about that. It's all frequencies. We're all on different frequencies. Right. And we change frequencies and we change, um, you know, we change where we are. And it was just like that. It's sort of, he was tuned out. I was going to another channel. Yep. And, um, in it, there's a, in this movie, and I'll do a lot of this movie stuff because I think our movies and our media is talking to us if we're ready to see it. Um, if we're ready to, to I, like the, I like that you're shaking your head, Jillian. Um, the Kundalini thing does that to you. It's like, yeah. it's like they're talking to us. Somebody is guiding us and they're sweet. And hmm. but most of us, we're not here to know it. We're here to really cause, raise hell. 
until we stop until we stop raising hell and then start seeing these things and that's what i think is going on i hope that doesn't upset anybody but no i think that's awesome i wanted to ask you um like when you were there with the, the hooded beings and it's, I'm not, I don't have a visual of the, of what they looked like. So I don't know if you could kind of describe like were their faces really like wrinkly or scrunched up or like what was the, the texture of their faces and what was the color of their, their, I know these are like the small details, but I'm just curious. Yeah, they were, they were dark. And um, like I said, that, um, that thing in the uh, communion with Christopher Walken, and he's interacting with those guys. Um, those are the guy, those are exactly the thing, except they had bright eyes and huge toothy smiles. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the, the size, the type of hood, the type of, you know, kind of dumpy body, you know, um, basically. Um, I think we see these things in, um, you know, human beings have seen these things. We got all these names for them, trolls. Mm -hmm leprechauns and mm. elves. Mm. I think that's what our real history is. And for you, and I know that we have like this limitation of language, but do you see these beings as being extraterrestrials and that you are an extraterrestrial soul or is it kind of beyond that where it doesn't really fit into that genre? I think it's, uh, it's multidimensional. Um, and you know, the whole thing with frequencies, um, I think that's what I think that's what we're really talking about here. Um, you know, we have we're on this Earth stage, and we have all these wars and all these incredible drama and all these things that happen to us. Um, but I think it's I think it's just another dimension. It's a really thick, solid, dense <laughs> dimension, and it and it really makes us believe it's real. Yeah, the density of it is so. Um impactful um and so when you because when you were saying i know jillian's got a question here in a minute as i want to let jillian hop in um but you were saying one of the things you were saying was um you know like you you went away and you were like oh i thought i was i thought i was bill letson isn't that hysterical i thought i was this this, this guy and if from that vantage point of, of being meta Bill, like you're beyond Bill, like, you know, like that is the character you're, you're playing in your earth um, role in this earth drama on this earth stage. How would you define the being that is meta Bill, that is beyond Bill, that is like the, the actor that's playing Bill? Um, he was part of those orbs, those colored balls. That, that was a welcoming, that was a, that, I mean, I just paraded right through all of these wow. colored walls, orbs. And it, they, it was just this welcoming, it was just this, you're loved so much, you, you know, you're one of us, you know. Mm. So yeah, I'm part of that, that, that incredible sense of everything is awesome. That's so and that's kind enough. of you're, you're you're kind of like this infinite being is kind of what I'm hearing you say is that you're just you're you're part of that. It's so it's it's hard to put words to it since it's so beyond. We physical. we all are. Yeah. We all every living thing is. I mean, down to plants and and even down, you know, if you listen to Bentoff, all the way down to some minerals. These are living souls incarnate into this. Wow into this place and we're at the high end. We have this ability to reason. We have this ability to choose um, between the left brain animal and the right brain divine being. And um, that's why uh, it's, this is such a unique, you know, round for us is this human round. Awesome. Jillian, do you wanna go ahead and hop in? Is this now a good time for you to hop in? Yeah. So um, a couple things you said, um, I'd heard during your NDE uh, that you were thinking back about being Bill Letson. Uh, could you fully remember what your life was like or was, was the memory of your life as Bill fragmented or was it more that you could just, you could pick up on the essence of who you were at that time while in the NDE state? No, it was, it was all there, every detail. Okay. Yeah. 
and, and I didn't give a hoot about any of it. <laughs> I'm, um, you know, that's that, that, you know, this, these kids write to me and they're going to commit, they want to commit suicide and stuff. And mm -hmm. I tell them to chill out. Uh, yeah, this yeah. is, this is just a joke. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how. Does Max the, have a question? I've <laughs> been the whole time. Um, yeah, I understand that. Like after I had my my own Kundalini awakening and I started that whole process, I view life as just a game. You know what I mean? I've had you know any hurdle that comes at me. You know, I know what it's like afterwards. I haven't had an NDE, but I have a very good understanding of what the process is, you know, through books I've read, through meditation experiences, through, you know, being, having contact with ET spirit. It's just a big game. Like it's, the, there's no anything, I mean, not to downplay anybody's struggles, however, and it goes, I feel like it goes back to, you know, you have a choice in how you want to absorb your experiences. Like you have a choice it, you know if I'm upset about something and I want something to change I have a choice in any given moment to either go down that negative route or to flip it around within my own energetic system and start experiencing it from a different perspective which ultimately you know doesn't usually go a bad way when you choose to do that do you understand what I'm saying absolutely yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. You um, you were telling me about your Kundalini awakening, and uh, you you're you at the high end of experiences with that, <laughs> with that whole Thanks. rumbling yeah. tail. It was crazy. I mean, it's um, like I was telling you beforehand. It you know there was the me before and the me after, and the fact that I just had no idea what was going on for quite a while. It um, I mean, it blew my third eye open. It blew you know, all of these things open. And there's, there's another question that I wanted to ask about these, you said they were elves that you had seen or beings like when you um, had your NDE, the three beings, right? Or you said they were elves in nature, like they seemed like elves. Yeah. Yeah, well, I had, um, the first thing I thought of when I had heard about that was uh, people who have DMT experiences who experience these mechanical elves. Right. You've heard of that, correct? Correct. Yeah. It was it anything like mechanical in nature that you had experienced within those three beings, or were they just something completely different than what I'm talking about? No, they had um, they, they had an organic um, sense to them, like they were beings of that dimension, wh wherever that was. But okay. you know, the, the the thing with the the mechanical elves, I. I, I see those things, you know, when I start to like drift off, they're yeah. really colorful and they're really, they're really jeweled and stuff and they're turning and moving in front of you. And mm -hmm. um, so I know what uh, Terrence McKenna was talking about because he, he wrote about them extensively and it, that's exactly what they look like. They're, right. you know, very that's intricate things. That's amazing. I haven't had, I know what you mean, because when I meditate and when I go to sleep, I do get imagery as well of different beings. And I haven't experienced like the mechanical elves, but I have experienced mechanical looking beings, like almost human, human, but a very mechanical look to them. And that was Oh, 2017 that I started to see them and they freaked me out a little bit because it was when I had first started, you know, everything had opened up. I still didn't know what was going on. And um, they did put me in a bit of fear, but I think it was more so myself, like my own stories that I was telling myself about what I was experiencing rather than any kind of, you know, negative projection on their end. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's all... You know, fear, as soon as we introduce fear into our emotional pattern, which is everything we are, really, it's an energetic uh, expression of who we are. And when we put fear in, um, all the all the love just shuts down yeah. and you, you become very contracted. Yeah, um, no, it's true. And it can it can kind of um, muddy up experiences as well. Like it. Um, 
going into fear. I know when I go into fear, if I have prolonged periods of that, I don't quite have experiences to the extent that I normally would. Right. And it's, you know, it's a, I have processes to get me out of those states, but it can come become very confusing, you know, to not quite understand how much fear can have an impact on your own system and your own experiences that come from, you know, internally your own energy. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, we, um, I was watching that movie contact, um, last week or something. And in the beginning of the movie, as it's rolling in, um, you hear that FDR quote where he's saying the only thing to fear is fear itself. It's, it's in the background. And you know, that quotes like that, they keep coming up. They, we, we are, we're given hints. And that, that is a true statement. The only thing to fear is fear itself because that shuts you down and it creates whatever you want to, whatever you want to focus on, it'll take you there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, thanks. I'll pass it on to somebody else, but I, yeah, I love hearing about this stuff. Oh, <laughs> excellent. That was great, Jillian. I loved, you know, I did not connect and make that connection between the machine elves, which you hear about with DMT experiences and the elves that, you know, the elves that, that Bill saw. So that's just brilliant. Um, Miss Linda, hop on in. I know you have some questions. I do. Um, so I, first I can really relate to that overwhelming love that you felt. Like when I try to describe it, I just say there aren't enough words for love to describe what I felt. It was all encompassing. I didn't see anything. It was just a void that I was in, but that, that love was just indescribable. And it was like home. Like I knew that if I just went further, I would be home. And coming back was like a, a chore. Like it was a decision I made. I could go forward, I could go back. But the reason I came back was more out of duty, not out of wanting to complete this life. And so right. when I got back here, there was a, it was like I had to reacclimate to being here. Did you go through that process at all where, you know, I, I just didn't quite relate to people the same way or experiences, like it was a difficult adjustment at times. It still is sometimes where I, like, I just want to say it's just a game. And, and the, the fear is from separation. The fear is the illusion of separation. Do you, did yeah, you go through that same thing? Oh yeah, I was, uh, you know, I say I was not happy for a few days, um, just sort of wondering what the heck happened and uh, why didn't I get to stay? And, you know, I was recovering from that whole thing with the dehydration. Um, so I had a few days on the, um, on the couch and, you know, I was, um, that was the first time I think I, this thing with the um, shaking hips, the shaking tailbone, that's the first time that I felt that. And it lasted several seconds. And my wife and I are watching TV and I'm like, can you see this? My, you know, the back, my, the lower part of my spine is going crazy. It was just, you know, and, and they say that this is a Kundalini awakening and, it starts to push through all of our emotional baggage. It starts going up the, um, you know, the spine up the uh, clearing out the chakras. And um, that was the first time I felt that. So I, I know we'll go into Kundalini later, but um, yeah, I wasn't happy for a few days, but you know, it was, it was a shock. It was an absolute shock to come back into this, dense place with all this bills and you know drama family stuff and it was like man that's this is just a this is a big act we're all pretending you know mm -hmm. so did you have a yeah. sense oh go ahead linda sorry oh no i just it's like a secret club that we have of knowing <laughs> that there's a, a difference out there and 
wishing everybody had that feeling of of knowing that this is this is something I believe we're creating or we're we're stepping into by choice. For me, it's for the experience. The whole thing is the experience to make the. I loved when you mentioned one time in another podcast that it's like an ocean. We came from an ocean, and that's how I talk about it. Sometimes it's this body of if we were as a body of water. We would come down in droplets and then evaporate and go back up. Yeah, that's uh, good. Yeah, and I just think that for me, I've seen people who will stay in that bliss spot, and that, and they're so attached to that spot of wanting to not lose that that bliss that they're they're not grounded in this life anymore. And I right. and and so it's for me. I I also it's like the the eat your rice, wash your bowl analogy of you just stepping back into this life and and um, it really adjusted how I felt about being kind to others and being connected to others did you feel that as well yeah yeah it was um it was slow with me um but uh yeah after a couple of days you know the the old firefighter there's no excuses you know what you're out on the fire line, you're hungry and you haven't slept, get up and get cut some fire line, you know? And I kind of had my conversation with myself. It's like, dude, get up and chop wood and carry water and get back in your life. Yeah, it's a bummer, but you're here for some reason and, you know, get back into the game. And uh, yeah, that's what I did. And, you know, the, you were talking about that, um, that feeling um, the, who helped me the most was um, Mary Neal, Dr. Mary Neal. She, uh, she, you know, she was a, a surgeon and um, had four kids and a husband and she had an accident in Chile where she was caught in her kayak and she drowned. And she, and she talked about peeling away from her body. Like you peel the back of a stamp off and it was effortless. And, and that, you know, I felt I've had that um, in the last few years. I've had this body leaving thing, that peeling away. We all do it every night. Um, we all soul travel. Um, but she helped me a lot um, with that. And, and she said she was with these beings of light and she was instantly not going anywhere near her previous life. Instantly. Four kids, a husband, a wonderful career. She said, I, I'm sleeping in my own bed tonight and I'm home. And, and that, that helped me. I was in the, uh, in the 2000s. I, I saw her video and I said, okay, I'm not alone. She said, she's really good. So that's a thing to talk about then, because, I mean, there are a lot of NDEers who just live the rest of their life homesick. You know, and I think that, you know, Linda is talking about this whole thing of like, well, I'm coming back out of obligation. <laughs> you know, it's not my first choice, but it's the best choice. Um, and so, you know, in this situation, Bill, you kind of like you didn't you officially didn't have a choice, even though I would probably say that was maybe a sole contract or a sole decision. Even if part of you is like, you know, your conscious part's like, no, and the rest of you is like too bad because you know, like you you have this you have your book you have to write for one thing. Now that you're, you're back here, you've got to write this book and, and help people out. Um, but like, how are you joyful? Cause you are a joyful man. You have such an open, beautiful, delicious heart. And how are you like that? When a lot of other NDEs are just like, ah, one day I get to die again. I just want to go home. Um, okay. This is, you'll like this. Uh, and this is, this is why, um, a couple of years after, you know, guys that were interested in spiritual stuff and religion, firefighters, they would approach me quietly because um, I kind of dummied up because I didn't want to be the kook of the fire department. And um, they would ask me. Um, one of them was really it was really fun how he did this. He says, OK, I've heard your story now without thinking. Who sent you back? And I answered immediately. I did. I sent me back. And 
he goes, what does that mean? And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> um, but if you look at that, you know, some of those graphics that I talk about in my other talks, and it shows us, it shows us this little guy, and then there's expanded, and there's a soul, and then there's the higher self, and this keeps expanding, expanding over soul. And um, yeah, those, you know, I, I'm just this temporary guy. And uh, there's a big, big hierarchy there, a big food chain. And I'm all, I'm all of it. Um, mm. So this bigger, higher version of me sent me back. And the best thing I can do and the best thing that these NDEers who are depressed and stuff is, um, you know, it comes from an Indian poem and it, it talks about um, walk your life and face your death like a, like a warrior going home like a hero going home. And um, I, I really think the reason, you know, I talked about that ISIS seeing this gold woman in the sky, this was just last year, huge shaking deck and this incredible woman who was absolutely overwhelmed with happiness. She was just so joyful and all I, the whole world was shaking uh, tremendously for me. And, um, you know, I think I did good on that, on that choice, you know, to take your missions, you know, accept your missions and, and get on with it. It ain't supposed to be fun. You know, we came here to push against uh, stuff that is unthinkable on the other side. Mm. So yeah, we're, everybody that's here is, is a huge hero. There's thousands of souls following you and cheering you every day this is what the universe is it's it's conscious beings it's um if you if you look in a blue sky and and let go you can see these darting in and out um well and that's i wanted to speak to that because it's like you kind of you kind of uh dropped a a little a tidbit there but didn't tell us the story so um before we talk about your experience with ISIS, I mean, I feel like I, I kind of want to, if, if there was a roadmap to give people to come through their, the pain of separation that they experience in the physical and help them to reconnect to the oneness while still in the physical, I feel like that's the trick, you know? And I feel like I feel like we can have fun. Like we, sh we have every opportunity to have fun here. Um, even while we're pushing against, you know, or I say disabling the dark forces that are in, in control. Like as we're here as secret agents to disable that, we can have fun doing that. But what I see is that people don't know how to have fun doing that until they're able to rather embody that oneness within. And I feel like you're able to embody the oneness within Bill, because you've talked about having flashes. You've had this experience where you saw who, who you understand to possibly be Isis, like a vision opened up for you and you got to see Isis like dancing around in this joy. Like you have these abilities of being able to connect into oneness. And so the people who are, who are struggling with that, who maybe don't have that are the ones who are going, oh, I wish I could just die again. So I'm not sure what my question is there, other than how do people, how would you encourage people to reconnect to oneness? How are you reconnecting to oneness? Okay, um, this, I, just, I just remembered this from my fire department days. I've been retired 10 years, but I was a captain and uh, had a big crew, you know, a few firefighters, a few, a driver. And so these guys are all type A's just like cops, they compete for the jobs. They, they, I mean, they're the cream of the cream. They have to jump through so many hoops with background checks and psychs, physicals. And you get them in the station and you got a bunch of type A's and they start picking on each other. And they'll get into, um, you know, they'll get into fights even like wars. And what I would do is if two guys got to the point where it was push and shove, I'd take them for a walk and I'd say, look, this is not a normal job. You, I need you guys. Uh, well, I need you tops. I need you getting along. The community's depending on you. The department's depending on you. You have a responsibility uh, to be your best all the time. 
And I, I would fold that right into somebody who is uh, walking the earth and say, look, you have a responsibility to the other side. Mm-hmm. You were sent here uh, with challenges, with missions, and they're all different and we don't understand them, but it's a really intricate pattern of where you're going to run into your next challenge. And, um, and you need to get your head in the game and know that, yeah, I end up in these situations where I'm sitting just at the verge of sleep. I'll be sitting and looking at a huge panel of people and they're all looking at me. They're all either smiling or they're neutral, but it's like a review. Um, and I'm there to, to, you know, in some form, I'm there answering for something or something at some other level. So this isn't fake. It's not pie in the sky it's it's absolutely real we are followed by all kinds of guides and helpers and and angels and um they expect the best from you so give give them your best mm. that's what i'd say give them your best mm. that's nice i mean that's it kind of it, again it's putting the responsibility back into our laps which is always where in truth it lies so it's it's about I guess everyone has to find their own journey, their own path into, into oneness. And I feel like once you're in that, you have that establishment, all oh, your animals are visiting us. Um, behind you there, um, your fur tribe there. Um, but uh, I, I feel like that is what we, that's one of our challenges is to be able to anchor that oneness into our, into our direct experience. So that way we are not, we can come out of the, we can realize it's a play and not be responding to this as, as a victim. Um, so tell us about now, cause you talked about it. So now you have to tell us about your experience of seeing Isis because people are not going to know what you're talking about when you, when you just mentioned it briefly. Okay. Um, I was, it was last year. I was going to go do the um, Santa Barbara ions or the, or the, you know, the conference, the IONS conference, International Association of Near-Death Studies. Um, they've been kind of my landing place. You know, they mm-hmm. helped um, uh, amazingly the, um, getting me started talking and stuff like that. So um, on this last time I, I, I gave these talks, I pushed the envelope a little further and you guys know what I'm talking about because you have these experiences and you let out so much, but okay, let's not go full wacko just yet. <laughs> and, and so I, t- I took it further than I ever thought I would. And I started talking about things um, that, you know, maybe I wouldn't have talked about uh, in years prior. And I put together this uh, the slideshow and I went outside, I sleep outside on the deck. Ever since all this started, I sleep outside under the stars because there's something going on with stars and I know I'm a crazy person, but it's, uh, um, so yeah, I'm out there and I'm started to fall asleep and I'm somewhere between, you know, that, that place between waking and sleeping and dreaming, that is a divine place. Everybody, everybody is touching it. And, um, everybody's, uh, you know, everybody has access to it and, um, Somebody told me that they said linger there and you'll you'll um, you'll really pick up on things. So anyway, I wasn't really trying to do anything. I was just sitting there looking at the stars, smiling, saying, "You know, I think I got this slideshow buffed out, and I think I can actually tackle this subject that you know puts me in in Cooksville, and uh, and, and I feel good about it." And um, and somewhere it something slipped, and the whole sky opened up and you know you see this in these old religious paintings with the sky opened up and the flowing robes and somebody reaching down and um with these paintings on the ceilings of chapels and stuff that's not a bunch of bs that that it, people see that I, I i think we don't see it as much because we're really disconnected from you know the planet and uh, who we really are um but yeah, those things are real. Those paintings are showing us something about what we all can do. 
Um, so anyway, I, there was this woman and she was gold and she was uh, sensual and she was athletic and she was, she was perfect. She was a perfect female other than my wife, outside of my wife. Um, <laughs> nice save. Nice save, Bill. And, and um, she was, she was stoked. I, I was like going, what in the heck is going on? It was the whole bed was shaking and everything, the whole ground was shaking. And um, I, I was thinking this, I can't, you know, the house isn't going to hold up with this. Um, and I looked her right in the eye. Cause I, I'm not, I'm not going to screw this moment up. Uh, I looked her right in the eye and her eyes were um, this really strange gold um, color. But the emotion that was coming from her was she was absolutely stoked. She was really excited. And um, she kept, she kept turning and gesturing towards the clouds and the sky behind her and smiling broadly. And uh, I've never said that before because I don't want to sound like something uh, like I'm saying I'm, I'm, you know, I've done something cool, but it's like, I don't know. She was like saying, you did it, dude. And I'm stoked. And I'm really stoked of what your words are going to do for humanity. Even if it's one person, it doesn't matter. Um, if it helps one person, the other side is ecstatic. And uh, so, yeah. And, and then the next day I was like, what in the heck that, you know, she had this outfit with these straps and this flowing thing and she was uh, perfect. And uh, it was, I could see details and, um, So yeah, and then and then everything just closed, just closed, and I don't know where it, and it ended with this huge uh, boom. If if you've ever been close to lightning, if lightning strikes near you, you'll hear this. You know, within a hundred or two hundred feet, you'll hear this boom, and then it'll echo like this really wild echo. It just goes whoa, 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 and um, that's how it ended. That's how that ended. And I just sat there stunned and I said, oh, my God, I, now I know why my our ancestors called them gods. Um, their power was uh, her power was undeniable. You did not mess with it. <laughs> there's there, you didn't need there's no inclination of even thinking of, uh, you know, saying, yeah, but what about this or, um, you know, or can we try it? My, there's no it does not come up. Um, and um, yeah, I told, and I told the story about, you know, we'd be out my, in my fire days, we out here in California, we'd get some big ones. And sometimes the fire would outflank you and you'd head for a safety zone or, you know, cover up and let it blow over you. And um, that's what that uh, felt like seeing her in the sky and that interaction, it felt like 80, 90 foot flames blowing by you ground is shaking a roaring sound and uh like a freight train going over you that's what uh, a big fire feels like and that's what you know that's really that's really if you laid on the tracks and let a freight train at full speed go over you that is what that isis encounter felt like um the cold woman in the sky encounter that's exactly what it felt like and um so did there is that did I answer that? Yeah, yeah, that was the that was the story. I wanted to make sure. And Miss Jillian has a question on that. Hop in, Miss Jillian. Yeah, no, just what you said about feeling like there's lightning around you. I um I've had that feeling with different beings that I've connected with as well. I had a uh, my first QHHT regression quantum healing hypnosis technique. It was in 2018, and we had like before those kinds of sessions, it's about a two hour conversation with the practitioner, what you want to bring out in the session and this and that. So we had um, decided to see if Dolores Cannon wanted to come through and just be with us at one point. And when she called her or invited her into the session, uh, about three quarters of the way through the two hour session, it felt to me like there were a thousand light bulbs turned on in the room and they were all facing 
our directions, like our bodies. And it had like that, like you mentioned, like as if lightning had struck really, really close to us. And it was just like this feeling of lightning kind of whipping around the room. And it was so cool. And when you said that, it instantly brought me back to that memory. <laughs> That's great. That's cool. Did you have any miss, uh, questions, Miss Linda, for Bill about Almighty oh, Isis? I'm flashing back to the 70s as watching the uh, show as a kid Did you, uh, on Saturday morning cartoons. Did you have a question, Miss Linda? Um, you know, I had this vision of you seeing her appreciating the sky, and I just think about how even these beings can appreciate the beauty in our nature. Like, like I, and that for me, one of the things I, I love doing is seeing the Colorado colors in the sky. There's just nothing like that. And, you know, of course I like brilliant colors. <laughs> <laughs> per your breath. Um, so, I mean, is that, did you actually also feel anything from her presence? Like, is there a communication that happened with you in that empathic part of you? Yes. And um, so I, I, I did the Jeff Mara podcast and I used words like sensual and sexual. And it's this, it's overwhelming. When we talk about love, we talk about shamans talk about pure love. This is a very powerful and it has a sensual side to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that was overwhelming. Um, you're just sitting there electrified um, after this, you know, went on. So was there I like think, a sexual energy? I'm sorry, Linda. I was just, oh no, just going to say, I, my, the words that come to me are full of, like, it's not just a spiritual love. It's not just a physical love. It's, it's like embodies everything. Is that? Yeah, like the, uh, yeah, the the um, what I've come to um, think is that the the universe is like this striving, creative life force, sensual energy. Uh, it, it's never going to be satisfied. It's just creating, and you know that's what we're here to do. We've got free reign to create. Uh, we can go up the scale or down the scale, or we can you know mm -hmm. raise hell, or we can or we can create heaven for others. Um, and that's uh, the whole thing is based on soul growth. Um, so yeah, it's a, a creative, sensual life force energy. And um, my, my wife and I, we watch, she goes, you know, the things you talk about, they're in these, they're in these sci-fi movies and these Harry Potters and, um, you know, this Star Trek series and, um, and we watched this movie, it was called Life Force. And um, it's a, you know, a teenage boy's dream, this beautiful brunette you know, walking around without a stitch of clothes on and wants to make out with everybody she runs into. And the name of the movie was Life Force. Um, and it has this sensual side. Mm -hmm. it. And it, it, it wasn't a porno movie or anything. It was, a, it was like a 90s sci-fi movie and, uh, Check it out. It's called Life Force. And the, the sensual side of the universe is right there for us to, mm -hmm. if you're ready to, you know, to pick up on that, it's right there. Yeah. So, what I'm getting for you is that there's no division between the sensual, spiritual and sexual. Like the sexual is spiritual. The spiritual is sexual. It's there's not like and humans have this delineation of this is sex. This is spirituality. And the universe is like, um, nope, it's one. That's what I'm getting for what you're saying. Yeah, there, this guy, there's this guy who wrote this book. It's called The Real History of the World. And it was a bestseller. And he, he talks about things and, and you know, he, he says we're, he says pretty much in every chapter, it's a big book, every chapter, the story is that we are upside down, inside out, um, backwards and through the looking glass with our approach to ourselves and our place in this world and um yeah you know that whole uh sensual sexual thing it, this is why you're seeing madonna uh you know on a super bowl halftime show she's 
those that's an old uh you know pagan ritual that they're showing that that works it's the connection that the movie uh, eyes wide shut that thing is all about our eyes are wide shut to that our sensual creative side is actually our spiritual side mm, whoa this is why you gotta write a book bill this is why like your guides we're talking last night i was talking to bill and two different people two different channelers were like um and the book now what about the book so the more i talk to you the more it becomes obvious that you like you've got so much to teach that if you just start to do it just start to write it out it's all going to pour out i wanted to talk to you also so what your 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 um before we talk about Kundalini, which we definitely want to talk about, because you wrote a book on Kundalini. That's you did write a book on Kundalini, didn't you, Bill? Um, yeah, it's called Full Contact Kundalini, and it it started with the NDE and then um, the DMT. Uh, sort of that was sort of a jump start, and then okay, um, and then the then the Kundalini became uh, the Kundalini became obvious. Uh, after a while and obvious to everyone around me that they told me you, you need to go focus on this this is happening to you it's for real so so th this okay so i want to talk to you oh, i'm sorry i'm like add right now um how do people get a hold of this book for one thing because i don't i'm multitasking i'm trying to find it online and i don't see it so it's not on amazon do people have to contact you directly to get a hold of this book um, yeah, that, that's what's going on. People are contacting me and I'm okay. Up, I'm updating it and, um, and yes, I'll get it out there. Okay. All right. So that's a book that's not quite out then. All right. I thought you already had it published. So what about the, a the alien, the ET abductions that you mentioned in your bio? What do you have to say about that? Cause this is something that I did not hear on your talk with Jeff Mara and we didn't talk about it last night. So what is going on with that? What's your experience with that? Um, yeah, my, um, I, I started going down to Costa Rica uh, right after I retired 2011 or so. And, um, and my dad, uh, passed away in 2013 and, you know, we all, we're all going to lose people. This is, this is what we do. Um, but it's, it's actually, uh, what happens if you, uh, if you're in, have someone in your life that you love, love, unconditionally love. You never fight with them. You never give up on them. They're always there. When that person, when that person uh, crosses over, they drag your energy with you, with them. And things start opening up uh, tremendously. So, you know, it, it, I'd get over the sadness thing. You know, my mom passed away a few weeks ago and I, I would just jump right past the sadness thing and into the, uh, the wonder thing, because um, you have an um, amazing opportunity to experience things. So um, yeah, my, my father um, passed away and then I was down in Costa Rica within a few, you know, six or eight months. And um, I was, I, I had these things my whole life where I was, I'd be in a car, I'd be in a dream, and I'd be in a car with some friends or something, and all of a sudden uh, the car would go off the side of a cliff and I would go out of the car and go up. Or I'd be jumping a bicycle off of something and the bicycle you know, would go way up in the air and I would keep going. And up, up, up was always the same. And it was mainly on surfing. Uh, I'd be surfing with my friends and he, this swell would come from underneath this energy would boil up and um, my board couldn't float. This was, the, this was the thing that was really strong. My board couldn't float anymore and I had to peel away from my board and go up. And um, so this is your mind telling you about something really profound that's happening. And uh, on this trip to, to Costa Rica, Costa Rica, you know, when you get out of the States, it's like a horse blanket of something's holding everything down here. And when you get into places where it's, people aren't so freaked out, um, <laughs> it, it really opens up, you know, cause, cause a lot of, a lot of fear does, um, 
you know, it shuts things down for a, a whole region. And um, so anyway, I was, I heard these, I was staying at this place near this uh, town, uh, what was it? Playa, Playa Grande. I was off by myself in this cabin. And I was starting to fall asleep. And I heard these three loud bangs out on a door. And um, there was nobody there. I knew nobody was there because no, nobody was anywhere. And it was these three loud bangs. And they're, they're, people get these things. That's right here. Uh, in fact, after my mom died, or after my, my father passed away, we had to install cameras for my mom because she said there's somebody banging on the doors every night and it's, they're just booming on. And I'm like going, mom, it's your third eye. You know, dad's, dad's pulling you. And, um, but we had to get cameras to show that there wasn't a, you know, she said there's a deer with the antlers and banging on the door and she, all these stories. And um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so I was in this place and I heard this banging and then I went to sleep. And um, it was a surfing thing. The wave came. I couldn't um, paddle away from it or whatever. And it, I separated from my surfboard and I went up. But this time I went up and I landed somewhere. And I was around these guys that were um, doing things. They had equipment and um, I was kind of relaxed about it. And I was like, well, this is what goes on in this life. And this is, these guys are here to kind of keep you going. And, you know, they um, boost you up and maybe change your mind about where you're going in life. Um, and this is kind of what goes on. A part of us, some astral body or something uh, is worked on and then it, it, it comes back into the physical body and it works on the physical body. And, um, you know, miraculous healings and things like this. <clears throat> I think there's a script in our lives. And when things start going off script, their corrections are made. I think that's what's going on with. So but, you experience going in this dream state going on to, because we're talking about alien abductions or ET abductions. So do you feel like you were hanging out with some ETs that were working on you on a ship, is that what you're just a chance like into? Like, what did they look like? What did your surroundings look like? What can you tell us for those details? Yeah, they look they look like the um, the typical ETs with the big eyes and the um, uh, diamond head, you know. Um, and they were cool. Uh, I I actually, you know, I asked them about something. They had some equipment or something and I asked him to show it. And then there was, I, I remember it vividly. Uh, this one guy, he looked at somebody who was at the head and the guy at the head said, yeah. And then he brought it over to me and uh, he was showing me and he was turning it over and, uh, and this went on for a while. And then um, the guy at the head kind of said, that's enough. And they put the equipment away and, you know, and I went, you know, they rolled me off somewhere. But my impression is these. My impression is these guys are taking care of us. Um, mm. But I don't want to, you know, I don't want a bunch of ET UFO people coming after me. Too late um, now. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's because it's like this is this is all. It's saying that we're it's all one. It's all like this continuum, right? You know. That's right. So were you watching them work on your body? Like, or was your body on a table and you were watching them work on it? Or like, what were you experiencing as they were working with equipment? What was that about? Um, I, I've, I've seen a lot of times uh, being uh, in this room and uh, there's a lot of wild things walking around in this room. Uh, you know, think about sci-fi movies and even cartoons. Um, you know the beings that they're in our they're in those these are they're in these movies uh, these non-physical beings but we're kind of the anomaly we're kind of uh, uh we we really are we're, we're we're kind of these little toys that the universe is playing with and um so yeah you see a lot you see giant snakes you know uh, moving uh, underneath your gurney and you see you know stuff that should scare the crap out of you but it never does. I'm just like, oh, cool. 
look at the size of him, you know, and um, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I, this happens a lot. Sometimes I'm held down and I'm giving like this jolt of divine electricity, mm. not our electricity that, you know, not, not the electricity that we use for a toaster. Right. It's divine <laughs> electricity from the sun that is, they charge you up and uh, you absolutely, you absolutely feel this huge lift, this invigoration. And um, yeah, they're looking out for us. As, as far as I know, maybe there's some bad ones out there that want to, you know, uh, st stick a needle in my eye or something. I don't know, but, <laughs> but I haven't so, had. But it sounds like you have regular, like this is something that you go off and do on a, on a semi-regular basis where you go pop into a ship and they give you upgrades and you're seeing other like beings that are non-human and you're like, hmm, oh, there's, there's a snake being, oh, there's a, you know, a whatever. And you're just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and <laughs> while you're there, while they're working on you, is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. That's accurate. I think I'm, I've gone to a new level of, uh, of, of cookness here, but. Um, Congratulations. Yeah. I have another nice salon. <laughs> um, Jillian, hop in with your question. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you 100%. We have so much stuff in common. Like, we got to do another one of these. Because I know. I've, had, I've, I've had so many crazy experiences that it really doesn't phase me the way that, you know, it could. Like, there was one. Oh, where was I? I have so many notes. Um, no, before that, just going back to what you said about, you know, when someone close to you passes away, if you could just go into the wonder, the wonder of that experience I had um my last boyfriend passed away in March of 2019 when I was pregnant with my toddler my son sorry and as soon, oh that's so good as soon as he passed away like he I mean he knew about my kundalini experience and he knew about how you know I con or how I'm open to contact with spirit so as soon as he passed you know I was obviously I was upset and I was in grief, but I was also open to contact. So as soon as he passed between him knowing how to come through and me knowing how to receive it, I was having crazy experiences right away. I mean, I had um, just one second. Sorry. <laughs> her little guy needs her attention for a second. Yes, Ms. Jillian. So yeah, during that time, I mean, even the time frame, I was six months when he passed, six months pregnant when he passed. Between that time and the time that I had my son, I mean, I was flying into OBEs. I had an experience with a light being in my room. Um, I was seeing him in my meditations. I was hearing his voice like upon waking up. Uh, OBE experiences with him. And it's just, and it goes back to that belief that I have that you know, I think you resonate and you were talking about it too, that life is a game. Like we're not, and if you can just open up to those possibilities after somebody passes, I mean, you're, everyone's entitled to their grief, but if you can be open up to those possibilities, it becomes really fun. In my opinion, like that was the most, honestly, I mean, it was probably the worst time of my life, but it was also the most fun. And it was the most wonder that I had ever really experienced. Yeah. What else was there? Was another point. My son is about to rip my fan off the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I have something real quick. All right. Yeah, I'll tagging leave it on that. and switch it to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, tagging on that, Jilly. And I just, um, you mentioned something and, and I feel this playfulness that is, for the contact with people on the other side after they've passed that um, has allowed me to do that more and versus a yearning. You know, I have so many people ask me, you know, why can't I feel this person? Why can't I've been waiting for this person for 20 years, you know, and I've had that experience with someone I'm a neighbor of mine that I um, am caring for and She's waited for her husband for 20 years. And when we started talking about just being able to be joyful and invite him in and be open to it, 
he started to show up to her. And, you know, I think that that playfulness is really important versus the yearning of why don't they show up or I really need this. It's more of, of that, hey, how you doing today? <laughs> is that yeah, how you good. feel, Bill? Um, yeah, that, that's good. As long as you have a, an appreciative heart and you're, you're going through life, uh, you're moving through life with gratitude, um, everything's available uh, to you after that. Um, wow. and, and when you start, you know, you start down into that lower vibration stuff, like jealousy or whatever, guilt, um, then everything shuts down. It, it's it's really obvious. This is the whole story. Yeah. Go ahead, Linda. Oh, I was just going to say that connection to that oneness for me, I think shows up as gratitude, even in difficult times, being grateful, walking, and I call it, you know, walking in grace of having that gratitude, no matter what's going on around for the experience. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i think that really does open like you you're both are just really harmonizing that this is what shifts your frequency so those those beings whether they were human or whether they were just your et guides or whatnot like your spirit of our openness is what allows them to connect it's when we're you know we have our head in the corner um saying why aren't they here why aren't they here well pull your head out of the corner and stop stop being myopic and start being grateful for the ways they are showing up that maybe you aren't noticing. Miss Jillian, did you have another follow-up question that you wanted to hit up here? Well, I was just gonna, yeah, the way I had started that whole bit was um, <laughs> how I agree with you in the sense of like, it's these experiences that I have, like they should to a certain point freak me out more than what they do. Like I had um, a physical encounter in my home uh, a few years ago, I, it was the first time I gone to a group meditation and it was based around uh, connecting with galactics and connecting with, you know, those that you were already connected with within other incarnations off planet. So I came home that night. Uh, my son wasn't born. My daughter was at my mother's house and I decided to sleep on the couch. Sometimes I just do that. And I had an experience where I was just there and I was looking at my wall. And all of a sudden, these three, this is going to sound crazy, but I'm in my, I'm in my company. <laughs> these three beings showed up flat against the wall and came through. And the way that they were, I mean, they were completely ET looking. They had, you know, the ET shaped uh, kind of teardrop head, the long neck, very long arms and torso. And the way that I was seeing them at first was they were uh, two dimensional flat against my wall. And they were solid black. I couldn't see any of their features. Um, so I just, you know, I just stared at it. And as I was looking, about a minute later, they started to come forward. And as they came forward, they went into more of a 3D, three-dimensional look. Like they gained uh, density, but the blackness lost some of its solidity. So I could then see through them. And the whole time, I mean, I don't know why I didn't there wasn't any fear. Like I was really like really dumbfounded and pretty excited that I was seeing that. And I remember all I did was I said, hello. And then they, they dissipated and I went to sleep. Like, I don't understand, you know, how it sometimes it's just these big experiences. Like they don't get to certain people the way that they would to others. And do you find that with yourself? Like when you have these big experiences, I mean, Typically, there's a time that I have to process them and I have to sit down and kind of think about it and let it all process through. But there's not that fear of the unknown, I guess. Maybe it has something to do just with um, experience with it. But what did what did you have to say about that? Um, what I have to say is uh, I think it's I think it all comes down to frequency. Um, it all comes down to if you're having higher, the higher frequencies. It, if you're having the higher frequencies, then you're open to that, uh, those higher dimensions. 
Right. Um, yeah. So when I um when I whenever I drive at, at night, the whole the roadway is, is purple, like freshly painted purple, and along the sides is like purple in this really rich blue and pinks. Um, it's it's all the time, and and lately, you know, this Kundalini thing, it's a progression. It's more. It's your your uh, nervous system opening up to where you can perceive more. And, oh yeah, yeah. And now when I when I drive um, when I drive now, and if I'm driving along and I go into some shadows of uh, trees or something like that, it's all purple underneath the trees. Yeah. It's um, hmm. it makes you see like, but. I under I don't quite see the purple. There was one point where I was kind of seeing different colors and I was seeing auras and stuff more than what I'm seeing now, but I understand what you mean. Um, where it, the, the Kundalini, like it works so heavily within your energetic system and it does so much clearing that you're able to perceive these things that you, oh. you aren't, or you, in my case, I wasn't able to perceive before. Not that you can't perceive them without having a kundalini experience. I mean, there's ways to clean out your own system and to be able to have those experiences. But I think what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you found with the kundalini experience that it opened your system up enough to be able to perceive these purples and these blues and these different colors. Um. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, um, you know, that that extends, you know, when I look in the blue sky, uh, it's like I'm in a snow globe, you know, and somebody shook mm -hmm. it up. And there's wow. like webs and vibrating strings. And do you see sparkles when you do that. Like when you're looking at the sky, does it sometimes look like it's filled with sparkles? Yeah, yeah. yeah me too. That's, me too. It's all it's all energy. And yeah, uh, yeah. if I sit if I, if I sit and um, let go, you know, it used to take 20, 30, 40 minutes to really let go, but now it happens in uh, five minutes. Yep. Wow. And yep. It, it all becomes, you know, a, 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 a blue sky becomes like a swirling uh, purple and green yep. sky, like the Aurora Borealis, which is, you know, that the Aurora is just a, I think is a physical, uh, manifestation of what the energy around us around us all the time um, yeah. yeah like bill i know you like to talk about movies and as we're talking all i can think of is the wizard of oz because i was thinking you know when i've had those experiences i felt like i was going from analog to hd and it was like oh no it's like from black and white to technicolor that that's what it felt like for me and you know what a great analogy for us. Yeah, yeah, you know that that that's interesting because that's I talk about the Wizard of Oz, uh, that movie, and there's there's a lo lots of movies, you know, the Matrix and all the space movies and stuff. Um, but the, the the Wizard of the Wizard of Oz, you know, that's like I say, there's you know there's a there's a caretakers of this place that are, when we start stop thinking about ourselves only and we start thinking in these bigger terms that you can see their messages and you know I, i'm in my 60s but i grew up the wizard of oz was played once a year and everybody gathered around the tv and watched that um and that the essence of that the entire the entire essence of that show is that you know you got the scarecrow needed a brain and the um the Tin Man needed a heart, and the um, lion needed courage. And um, you know, if we, if we, the message I get very clear to me that if we ignore the left brain, the the brain of the beast, you know, the mind of the the beast that we're taking a ride in, and we focus <laughs> on the divine mind, if we use our brain to to live our lives by the compassion of the heart. And when things start to open, if we face them without fear, with courage, uh, we get to go home. And that's that whole dang story. 
Mm, wow. <laughs> I never thought of um mm. so so Bill, let's let's uh make sure we get into the talk about Kundalini and DMT because we've only got about 30 minutes left of the show. So you talked a little bit earlier about DMT or not DMT, about Kundalini, like your hips are starting to rock and shake and you had these vibrations. And then I know um, you've had experiences with ayahuasca where it reawoke your Kundalini energy and your hips were shaking. And something really cool you said to me last night when we were doing our pre-show talk was that the within every being, there is a God seed at the base of the spine. So I'm wondering if you could start with talking about that God seed at the base of the spine and how your experience of that was amplified with DMT. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that whole thing with the Kundalini is that every human being has a seed, a, a source seed, a drop of pure light on the base of our spine. And, um, it sits down there and we go through thousands of lives. And um, at some point we, at some point we start getting a compassionate heart. Um, the, the, and the progression is, is right there in the movie um, Groundhog Day, where Bill Murray is this kind of media guy and he's kind of a a-hole and, <laughs> uh, and you know, he, each day, the, the premise is, and each day he wakes up and um, each day is a new life. That's the, the premise. And uh, you, each day you have, you can do whatever you want with that life. And uh, what he does as you watch the movie is, um, you know, he learns how to steal money and how to hustle uh, everybody. And, um, and he gets tired of it. And then he, he's, wants to go home he's starting to remember who he really is and he um he starts the whole suicide thing so you know the people who are depressed and they they write to me about suicide i tell them man you are you are ready to pop you're right there um uh to hang in there um so yeah and then he kills himself all these different ways and it's all very comical and entertaining and then there's this scene in the diner where he's talking to everybody he's wake and he's woke up and, and he says, he says, uh, I've come to the conclusion that I'm a God. I'm not the God, I don't think, but you know, I'm an eternal being. And, uh, it's, it's so obvious that, um, you know, this is, this is such a great message. And he starts living his life every day. He's doing something for little old ladies or he's saving a kid falling out of a tree or he's, you know, it's one thing after another. He fills up his day with kind, compassionate uh, things. And he's, Bill doesn't matter anymore. He doesn't care about him. He disappears. Um, this is the whole thing about the self. You know, Buddhism and Zen is getting over the self, not thinking from a place of the self, just uh, of helping others. Um, so so I, I think... Yeah, I know. I know you asked me a question. And I, DMT. <laughs> how does this? How does this all come back to DMT and the awakening of your Kundalini? <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, this is the awakening of the Kundalini. We have thousands of lives, and our vibration is. You know, you can tell through this movie. He slowly becomes somebody you want to hang out with, and um, our vibration changes and. Uh, we become a brighter soul that everyone enjoys. You know, he's, he, everyone likes him in town and stuff at the end. Um, and it's, 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 it all comes down to our vibration, our frequency. Um, we, we start to resonate with those higher uh, frequencies and we start to vibrate out of this place. Uh, this, this place is very heavy, um, you know, dark frequencies that, that don't exist where we come from. So, so bring us into the ayahuasca experience though. I want you to like go into the ayahuasca experience so we can understand what that was about for you and how that impacted your connection with uh, your Kundalini. What were you doing when you took ayahuasca? Where were you at? What was going on? 
Okay. I, I was, uh, it, this was you know, like we talked about, it was a handful of times and a couple of times I really went for it and I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, the first time I, I drank it, I, it was this huge, thick black cup of, uh, stuff from these amazing, um, shamans, not like the movies you see where it's this nice, you know, tea and you get a little glass. You get, you get this when they're when they're going to go to a, when you're going to do a healing ceremony, um, they're going to rock your world. They're going to rock you out of your world. And, um, you know, these guys are tigers. Uh, they like the tiger shamans. And this is uh, in Costa, our, Costa Rica. Were you in Costa Rica when this happened? Uh, yeah, I was in Costa Rica. And this was with the, the Colombian shaman Taita Juanito. He's incredibly legitimate. He's a sweet soul. All the guys that hang with him uh eli and mitra and leonardo these guys are are the sweetest guys in the world they're angels um but they put you into a situation that's you know if you're lucky you go into the pit um where you spend hours in this you know really rough place and it it breaks through this the the self back to the self thing so um yeah, I, there's uh, there's so much there. I, I'm getting off. You're you're trying to get me to talk about um, I, drinking ayahuasca and kundalini. Yep. Um, <laughs> the thing that <laughs> the thing that I remember most about that is in the morning that I had that tail uh, that tailbone shaking thing. It was really super strong, and um, and I had this this energy this pouring energy that was pouring up through me. Um, you know, you're up all night, so you sleep the next day. But the next morning, I usually would go for a run through Costa Rica, through the town of uh, Guiones. And um, it was about six, seven mile run. And I ran that, but it felt like I didn't even, so I, ran, I got back, I ran it again. And then I ran it a third time. And I saw my, some friends and they said, we saw you leave here at eight o'clock this morning. You're still running. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not getting tired. Um, so this, the ayahuasca, it, it kicks something in a healing ceremony to where you start purging this emotional baggage mm -hmm. that we, we carry this, it's lifetimes and lifetimes. You know, all of us have uh, a situation where let's say you're, you're somewhere and all of a sudden you feel something like if you have a knife in your hand, you're like, oh, this is, I don't like having a knife in my hand. We've got something in our past and it left a mark. And what ayahuasca does is it goes through and, you know, when you purge all those energies, those emotional baggage, that energy pours out of you. I mean, I actually saw it, it was a blue black substance and, and it moved across the floor and um, it wasn't from this world. The shaman saw it. Mm. He told one of his guys to sweep the area, you know, this pavilion we were on, he to sweep uh, the area because it left the bucket and was, was moving and he swept it out into the jungle. And, um, you know, these talking about things like this, this is, you know, we're into the ridiculous. And we awesome. love it. So did you, did you find the blue, did, because you said the blue and black substance was out of this world. Did it feel like that was some sort of a lower density of life form or consciousness or something that had attached itself to you and the ayahuasca caused it to leave your system when you purged? Or was it something that you had created that had took on its own energy? That, that was something from some past trauma. We all have them. Okay. Uh, something where you are emotionally destroyed this life or thousand lives before who, who knows, but it's hanging out on the soul and mm. you're carrying it. You know, yeah, that's why you, it's so easy to forgive people because, you know, they get a drink in them or something and that energy comes roaring to the forefront. And it's like, you know, it, it, that wasn't my friend and I'm not going to worry about it. You know? So go ahead. No, I was just saying, so you don't have an attachment to what it was. You just know it was some sort of residual energy that it was time for it to get, get out of there so you could go on and do the next thing. 
Yeah, yeah. The, in my opinion, the whole thing with um, ayahuasca is uh, that you're going to, you know, we, we cruise around here, left brain, right brain. The left brain is the mind of the beast and it, it runs around in this earth and me, gimme, 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 you know, mm-hmm. for me, this whole story. And the right brain is connected to who we really are. It's this uh, oneness, this divine love. And um, so that, but that left brain is 100% of the time is in charge of your, you know, your, your thoughts. And ayahuasca is going to flop that brain. It's going to flip that brain. It's going to take the you that you're used to, tie them up, throw them in the trunk and gag them. And, and the divine you is going to drive for a few hours. Mm. And, and that guy in the trunk, he can put up a stink and uh, that's when you suffer for three, four hours where you're just rolling around moaning and drooling and uh, you know, you're, 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 and, and another thing is when what ayahuasca does, it's going to take you into those realms where the soul and the higher self and uh, you know, the over soul and all this stuff, you're going to go into those realms and meet them. Um, and that energy, it stays here. That heavy, dark energy, it stays here on earth and uh, there's no room for it uh, if you're going to successfully go through a healing ceremony. And your body, it, it feels like you're, when you drink it, if, if for an hour or so, it feels like you're getting punched in the stomach. And I asked somebody about it and they said, well, yeah, the medicine is grabbing all of the bad energy from your liver and from your lungs and and it's bringing it to your stomach and then you purge it. And that, it sounds ridiculous, but that's exactly what happened. No, that makes total sense. I, I, I light just turned on when you explained it. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, cool. So I wanted to ask you then also, um, when you were in the uh, journey of ayahuasca and you're, so you've, you've got the guy in the trunk, he's successfully in the trunk. And, and so your spiritual self, is in connection. Did you have a reconnection or an experience with the three little um, elf beings that are your family, that are kind of your soul family? Um, no, no, I didn't see them. I saw this at the at the. This is kind of funny because I told my wife after ayahuasca, you have to spend weeks and months processing what happened because you really have no clue what you just went through. And, um, and I told, I got back here and a, a couple of weeks later, uh, we went to dinner and I just kind of walked around the car. We were going into, and I go, it was like, there were two of me. There was, there were two of me and they were trying to be in charge. And there was a third me that was watching the whole thing. And so this whole thing with self and soul and higher self, you're, perspective uh is bouncing between these and um you know that's why it's such a wild night and um so at, at one point i and I, uh, i'm gonna go to a new level here uh, yay <laughs> but at, at one point at one point i saw this being and it looked like a bunch of squiggly lines like a big ball of string or wires or something and it was just this really energetic thing and there was a lot faces coming out of it and stuff like that but what i felt from him when i was at my worst was nothing but love uh compassion and um love and a sense of you have to walk this path and i'm sorry that you're going through this and it's so hard on you and you're doing a good job it, it has to be. And um, that kind of calmed me down. I was like, I am looking at things that are way beyond my ability to even put words to it or understand it. Um, but, you know, with this, with the Kundalini and what's happening um, lately, if I sit still, because my wife's like, you know, she's like, how long does it take before you start seeing colors moving on the walls and and then these um faces show up and these highly energetic beings are you see them in these movies they're um 
what was it? One of those movies there was just this really a bunch of twisted um, like strings. It looks like um, it's an energetic being of pure awareness. This is what we are. And it has this, I don't know. This is what I see. And um, I see it on the walls now. It really quickly, wow. it comes up. And, um, and there's another, Okay, did that, I, I don't want to drone on too long here. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, 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 I see this, it's, it's this whole thing, it's the third eye thing, you know, that um, when the Kundalini rises, Jillian was talking about when she, um, everything happened at once for her. And for me, it took months and years but um, I had the same thing. I would wake up in my room and there would be a, it, there was light, there was like this light coming out of my eyes and the whole room was like lit from me. And I had this euphoria and this, everything was spinning like wild energy. And it happened like three, four nights uh, out of a week. You know, I'd get a day off and there's, but I'd, I'd wake up this, obviously this energy had come out all the way up and it blew out the top. And, um, mm. and after that, the, the, you know, the, the visions really started and stuff. Um, I, I, it would have been nice to have gone her route because it seemed like it happened all at once. And I didn't really, I've never talked to anybody, but I've read that that is what happens. And, but mine was uh, slow. I think I had a lot of stuff to get out of the way. So, mm. Did you have any reflections on that, Jillian? Have you encountered the squiggles that turn into faces or any of that? I've encountered a lot of things, but most of my stuff, like how you, Bill, how you describe, you'll see it kind of appear on the wall, things like that, like imagery and faces. Is that correct, what you're saying? Yes. Me, I get the same thing, but it's when I close my eyes. So if I close my eyes and I, you know, even like what you said, it used to take me a long time to kind of get into that state where I'd be relaxed enough to be able to get that imagery and see the random things and people, places I'd have never seen before, just all kinds of wacky stuff. But it's when I close my eyes. So to me, the image comes up and it's like, there's the blackness behind my eyes and then it's going to sound weird, but it's almost like the screen pops up. And then I see these images just the same as I'm sitting here with my eyeballs open and seeing you guys, but it's completely through my third eye. And the only one difference is that, um, you know, with my physical eyes, I need glasses and things are often blurry. But when I get the imagery, through, you know, through the third eye, when I'm doing that relaxation and the meditation, it's completely clear. So that's the only one difference between that experience and physically looking at something with my eyes open, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guys are so cool. Oh, thank you, are too. <laughs> I, you <laughs> I told you, I, I told you guys when I started, I go, oh, this is gonna be awesome because it's free oh, therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is too. And I mean, you can't, I, if I went to a, a psychiatrist and told them, you know, all this stuff, which I know won't do. <laughs> it's it's not going to be good. The outcome is typically not good. So <laughs> to be on here and to be able to, even when I asked you if you see spark, because you had said that you saw, you know, the colors and stuff in the sky. And when I said, well, do you see sparkles? Because you had mentioned it being almost like a snow globe. And you said, yes, that just little piece is so validating to these kinds of experiences when you can catch those little pieces, you know, with the Kundalini specifically, and you, yeah, you can catch those little pieces that are the same for other people or very similar. It's very validating because it can be a rough path of, you know, I mean, I know I experience these things, but at the same time, I'm a human being. So I go through those periods of like, am I not? Like, am I crazy? Am I losing my mind? Mm -hmm. But then it's so I, it always comes back to no, these are, you know, 
if I were crazy, I don't think I'd be having these meditation experiences and these o- OBEs. Anyway, that was the tangent that I just went off on. <laughs> well, I think that's great. That's great. That's great. Can, can, can I speak to the third eye thing? Uh, just to bring this full circle. Um, the, so yeah, the Kundalini arises and then you, it blows out the top and, and then you start getting these vibrations. And I, I, it started with just this flashing in the sky and, um, and then it turned into vibrations. And, um, but with the, and then the, your, your third eye is, uh, is opened. And so we talk about the third eye and this is the, um, the pineal gland. And this is where the DMT is made for us in our bodies. That's a natural thing. Um, and the, the pineal gland drops a little uh, DMT into your brain uh, every night when you sleep. And this is soul travel. This is how we leave our bodies. And, um, and when we die, it splashes the brain with a huge amount and, um, and it rockets you out of your body and you, you leave the container behind. Um, and that's what uh, Rick Straussman's work was all about. Uh, but he injected, you know, volunteers, he injected volunteers with a, with a huge dose and um, they go on this 10, 15 minute journey out of their body, which was like a, a, a rocket ship trip with beings all around them. And, you know, I recommend for any, um, atheists out there to um before you set up a booth in the park and tell 10 year olds that uh you're just a slab of meat and you're going to die and you don't exist um take do it smoke some dmt and uh your atheism club days are over (laughs) um because yeah there's beings around us so the third eye and and so it's a pineal gland and it's actually like a, a little tip of your finger is the size of it and um and inside it is rods and cones, just like our regular eyeball. Mm-hmm. And it's filled with uh, this piezoelectric water, this light infused divine electricity water. And, and it's hardwired directly into the visual cortex of the brain. So yeah, you're, it, you're, it's true, Jillian, when you, you're looking at the sky and it's like, how come I can see blue sky over here but in front of me, there is a screen with, you know, a donkey chasing a dragon. And uh, because that that is projected, that um, that third eye, you know, it gets it gets its a, its spot in the brain to to put out its information. And, oh, for sure. mm, mm. Yeah. Wow. And it, it's, it's, it's all down. through. Yeah, it's all through the third eye and it's all projection of. I know what you're saying. I can't put it into my own terms, but I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, it's not it's it's not in our head or our thoughts or our ma- imagination. It's a it's a physically wired item, you know, the seat of the soul. That's what the third eye, the pineal gland is, and it's physically wired into our visual cortex. And um, when you're looking at things, you're actually energetically looking at other things, other places. Oh, for sure. That was a great breakdown of, I've never had anyone explain it that way. So that made, because then you have an inner screen that turns on and it's part of your genetic makeup. It's just that we've had it turned off for so long. Oh yeah. That was fantastic. So we are coming to the end of the show, Bill. Before we wrap up, I wanted to give you, is there anything that your heart, your big, gorgeous, open heart would like to say to the audience in terms of words of wisdom and love? Um, yeah, uh, I, I do. Um, you and I talked a little bit about um, the uh, procession of the equinox and how there's a, a, lo- a long a great year, a 24, 25,000 year <clears throat> cycle that the earth goes through. And there's been lots of books written about this. And there's a group called uh, Procession and uh, the Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge. And they talk about the, the plateau. This is a, the last great civilization, Egypt. Uh, they talk about the alignment of the pyramids and how that matches the um, alignment of Orion's belt in the sky and the Pleiades and um, 
And what they were saying was that what's going on here on earth is uh, what's going on here on earth is, um, is connected to the sky. It's connected to the stars. Um, so yeah, we, we, we don't really come from this place. Uh, we're down here to have all these wonderful adventures and um, these cycles of golden years and um, iron hard years. We're just coming out of the hard years and we're, we're starting to climb back into a silver age. And this is all um, the yugas, you know, the Hindu teaching and the Mayas, um, the Mayans. Um, they talk about this and, and this is just for you guys. Um, this chunk of time right now, as we move to the silver age, uh, is, is known as the age of heroes. And it's a couple of dozen centuries long. And people like you guys, people like us, uh, we step forward and we talk and we help someone else. And, uh, it's all, it's all scripted. It's all planned. And, um, you know, we do our, we do our part and, uh, you're, you're part of, you're part of a really important thing that goes on and, um, and everybody else, uh, can just relax because this cycle has gone on forever. Uh, this is what these experts are saying when we talk about, you know, all these things about the galaxies and all that, this has gone on forever. This is a huge stage. And, um, this is where we learn that at the end of, um, the movie Contact, Jodie Foster meets this. This is the whole message they're telling uh, everyone. That, relax, go through your, you know, hit your marks, go through your adventures and um, enjoy the ride. Uh, it, it, nothing's coming and nothing's going. We're, we're just coming into this place and we're, and we're learning, we're growing. All right, that was it. Wisdom. That was great. Yeah, and um, Procession at the Equinox, I'm just putting that into our little chat because people can look that up and get even more details on that. And just from our conversation that, well, your and mine, Bill, that we had last night, like I really so get like that this dimension is a stage that our soul enters onto. Like I like it's something I've known, but it the there's just always an expansion and a deeper awareness and a bigger more lights turn on. And so just talking with you, it's like, it's really clear to me that this is an endless spinning disc of reality that goes through stages and we keep entering it in at different spots while that disc continues to spin and that stage continues to spin and then pull out of it. But that disc is eternal as we are popping in and out of it. That's how I see it now. That's so good. You That's gave cool. that to me, Bill. Um, so <laughs> Uh, before I toss it over to Linda, I want to make sure we just say thank you so much to Bill for being here. You are just so delightful, and we will definitely have you on the show again if you're willing to to join us again. Oh yeah, so, awesome! Because yeah. I feel therapy. like there's free therapy on Third Eye Salon here every Saturday. <laughs> um, but I, I, I feel like I feel like we've just there's so much more to even crack open with you because I think there's you have so many experiences. So um, let us know in the comments below if you'd like to see Bill back on, because um, I know I would love to have him back on, but we'd like to hear from our people as well. And then I wanted to make sure that we let you know next week, our guest is going to be Christopher Lovestone. And we're going to talk about the conscious cockadoodle, the a word I can't say, the conscious rooster. Uh, so in terms of like male sexuality and being able to, um, the elevation and evolution of male sexuality so that it's conscious, and not the toxic masculinity that we might see running rampant on the planet. So we're going to talk about that with Christopher Lovestone next Saturday. So that is going to be fun. And then also, you know, to remind you to go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you haven't already subscribed, click the notification bell and join us in, um, join us here next Saturday. Miss Linda, I will toss you the mic so you can um, thank our people and lead us out. I have had such a great discussion on the side with all of our people that have joined us live and appreciate always that I learn as much from you guys as our guests. So thank you for being a part of this year. What makes this um, extra special every single week. Thank you. 
All right. And then we also want to make sure that people um, check out our links below for the to sign up on Facebook, our events and our Facebook group. Feel free to buy us a virtual coffee. We always love that financial love support as well. And then Miss Linda has control of, of ending the video. So do you want to just bring us out, Miss Linda? I will reluctantly end it for today. <laughs> Who wants to end the show? I don't, but not me, but I will do it. <laughs> We will see you next week. I love you guys and we will have Bill back. Thank you.